This week, Africa's killing fields, two humanitarian horrors, wars still neglected. Darfur, where relief missions struggle as the Sudanese government expels Western aid workers. I talked with Canadian doctor Samantha Nutt, who's just back from the refugee camps. And Congo, often called Africa's world war. It shows no signs of abating. Three experts explain the roots of a conflict and how it could conceivably end. Hello, I'm Brian Stewart. Welcome to Our World. The horrible civil war that has terrorized the people of Darfur, Sudan, has been with us for a long time, six years. An estimated 300,000 people have died. Violence has displaced more than two million people. Millions more survive on humanitarian aid. It's a civil war that pits different ethnic groups, the government and its proxy fighters, the Muslim Janjaweed, against black African farmers in the west of the country. The struggle is largely about control over scarce resources, land and water supplies. The international community's occasional cries of outrage have not stopped the slaughter. Sudan's government denies the extent of the humanitarian crisis. It was infuriated when the International Criminal Court issued a warrant for arrest of the president himself, Omar Hassan al-Bashir, accusing him of orchestrating the mass killings. Now, as a result, Sudan recently expelled 13 international aid organizations from the country, leaving millions of people even more vulnerable. Samantha Nutt is a Canadian doctor and a founder of the organization War Child Canada, which works in Darfur. She recently returned from her latest visit, and I was anxious to get her assessment. Could you give us an update, a situation report, on just what is happening in the Darfur region now? Well, the war in Darfur has been going on since 2003. Roughly two million people have been forced from their homes, so displaced uh, within their communities and forced into what are called internally displaced camps. So they're living in a kind of refugee camp, but within their own country. Uh, as a result of the recent expulsion of about 13 international organizations, that's had a tremendous impact on the humanitarian situation on the ground. Those organizations were responsible for roughly half of all humanitarian assistance, particularly around basic needs, so food, water, shelter, health care. So what that means is, especially right now in Darfur, as we approach the rainy season, we can expect to see food gaps. In fact, there are about a million people that are expected to experience food shortages. There are about 700,000 people that need shelter, that currently are, are at risk of, of uh, you know, being left without shelter in the event of, of the rainy season starting. So these are the kinds of things that we're trying to cope with on the ground. Now, a number of people, yourself included, and... Uh, Mia Farrow, uh, stars have tried to bring attention over and over again to Darfur, but the world's attention seems to flare up sometime and then dies down. It's very unsteady. How do you explain that? Well, people do tend to, I mean, the crisis in Darfur has been going on now for more than six years. 300,000 people are believed to have lost their lives in that war. At various periods of moments in time, there has been a lot of attention that's been paid to the crisis. You know, certainly as a result of recent developments, I hope that uh, Canadians in particular are paying attention to what's happening in Darfur, to the needs that are, uh, are on the ground, uh, and I'm hoping that they will respond to that, the Canadian public as well as the Canadian government. But it's always a challenge. You know, the longer a conflict drags on, this is different from a natural disaster, where things seem to happen all at once and the response is immediate, and then people go back to, to their lives. I mean, a, a war like in Darfur, that drags drags on for many, many years, it's very easy for people's attention to start to wane. And then organizations like ours, we need to ensure that it stays on the agenda and stays on the radar. Right. I think one of the depressing things I've found with the Darfur story is the inadequacy of international response. That uh, I think originally there was supposed to be a force of about 25,000 United Nations and African Union troops together. I think it's hardly more than 13,000 in all. Terribly under-equipped don't have helicopters and anything like the numbers they need. Uh, so it's not just that the world is not responding, it's, it's responding in ways that are ludicrously inadequate, it seems. Well, you're right. I, you know, in terms of peacekeeping, the peacekeeping response has been woefully inadequate. Darfur is an area, it's roughly the size of France, so this is a, this is a huge uh, area that has to be covered. 
they have asked for, and in fact the Security Council approved, the deployment of 26,000 United Nations peacekeepers to the region. Unfortunately, fewer than half still now, a few years later, have actually been deployed. So it's very difficult to, you know, not only uh, engage in security uh, operations, but also to make sure that the humanitarian response is, is meeting the needs of those on the ground because of understaffing, because of bad security, which does tie again into, uh, you know, the inadequate international response. But it's really, it, you know, it's more than that as well. It's, uh, you know, when you look at the last, since the war in Darfur started in 2003, people f already feel as if their troops, particularly Western countries, are already overextended. They're extended in Iraq, they're in, uh, either in Afghanistan, and so the, the reasoning that's been offered up is, well, in fact, we just don't have any more resources at our disposal to be able to respond to the crisis in Darfur. You know, personally, I don't uh, support that as an argument. I think that there are always ways that we can be more effective and more engaged, and if it's not through the promotion of peace and security in the region, it should be through our development response. But again, it has been, up until now, more muted than I would have liked to have seen. Take us to what you see on the ground. Uh, you've taken some footage, I know, when you were there, but when you go to Darfur, it, it's, we hear of such a horrible, horrible uh, place of, of misery and, and, and atrocity. What do you actually see? Well, you know, you do see that. I mean, I was in, just not that long ago, just a week ago, I was in camps for uh, people who've been displaced by the conflict, speaking with women, talking about uh, their experiences. You know, I can remember sitting on a grass mat uh, in an internally displaced camp talking to a woman by the name of Nadia, who was 23, and she had uh, five children. And she talked to me about being in her village uh, a few years ago and seeing her father, her husband, her mother, and six of her uncles and all of her brothers literally gunned down in front of her while she hid in the grass with her infant son. And in the face of that horror, you know, we, War Child is an organization, we have programming in those camps, we do work in the area of livelihoods and education, and we have programs specifically targeting women like Nadia. And I remember, you know, sitting there and I said to her, what can we possibly do that can help you? You know, what have, have has our programming been helping you? And she didn't say anything. She was in our educational program. And she looked up at me, and then she wrote her name in the sand. And she turned to me afterwards, and she said, now that I know how to write my own name, this is a woman who was completely illiterate before she started our programs, now that I can write my own name, I want to learn to write the names of all of my children. And it's amazing to me that you can see hope amidst the chaos, and you see people who so very much want to be able to rebuild their lives and to advance themselves and to make sure that their children have access to schooling. So that even in those very, very dark circumstances, uh, the, the courage of people to continue on and to help build peace in their communities to me is absolutely astounding. I'm always amazed by people's resilience and their capacity to, to try to rise above the horror of their lives. It's something too that's not perhaps uh, widely enough known that a lot of the volunteer groups that are in there uh, in these desperate places are not just doing feeding or support or, or shelter but they're also working on areas like education or things that can improve the life of the people, even at a time of war and uncertainty, you can do much. Well, and you absolutely have to, because especially in a place like Darfur, where the war has been going on for more than six years, you know, you can't just focus on basic needs. You also have to think about people's livelihoods. How are they going to ever be able to get out of these camps? That's going to require educational programs for children, educational programs for women, support in the area of livelihoods, so skills training, even sometimes in some cases microenterprise, those types of activities activities also help to keep some of the kids out of the fighting forces so it stops them from, from being recruited in the first place because they have other ways of making money. So you have to have a vision to the lo for the long term, even in a case of conflict, but especially once that conflict becomes very protracted. And the expulsion of the NGOs has hit that sector, the sector sort of outside of basic needs, probably the hardest because many of the groups that were expelled were responsible for things like education, uh, you know, sanitation, livelihoods work with, with families and with children, psychological programming, which in this circumstance is very, very important. And unfortunately, those are the programs that were the first to close. And one of the things that I saw time and time again is that I had literally thousands of people displaced by the conflict living in these camps coming up to me and saying, 
can Warchild step in? Can Warchild, because this is the type of work we do, take over from some of these organizations that were expelled and deliver those services? But unfortunately, you know, for us, it's that, that's a very, very difficult thing for, for us to, to try and do that in Darfur at this moment. We're going to certainly try to do what we can. But like every organization, we have limited resources. Um, and and you're working flat out as we're it is. We're working flat out as it is. We work already with 100,000 internally displaced people. For us to then double or even triple those efforts to make up for those shortfalls is a monumental task. At the same time, the security situation is so atrocious that for us to really expand uh, you know, very, very rapidly to, meet, to fill those gaps and meet those needs would put us as an organization and our staff at risk. It's hard to understand how the world can continue to say, we're trying, but we're not just able, people aren't volunteering. We don't have enough countries doing something. I mean, somebody's not stepping up to the plate, presumably, and saying, this is our world responsibility and we're going to get it done. Well, I think it's going to take a lot of leadership, and it's going to take a lot of leadership at the level of, of international governments. Uh, that's where we're going to start to see change happen. It's going to require a financial investment in Darfur, increasing our aid budget to Darfur, which unfortunately uh, has been uh, something that's long, long overdue. Um, I mean Canadian aid uh, budget. Canadian aid budget as well, but paying a lot of attention to the region, trying to, to apply pressure to, to ensure that the peace process in that, in that part of the world continues. Um, but it's... Uh, you know, in my experience, it's never, there's never a failure of opportunity to affect change. It's that too often we are paralyzed by our unwillingness to even try. And we see that at the level of government, and we also see that at the level of individuals, because we know, I mean, for example, for our work, we know that when we have the resources that we can mount an effective response, what constrains us is that usually we don't have those resources in the first place. I have a great worry that as the economic crisis sweeps the, across the poorest part of the world, the needs are just going to go through the roof in terms of, again, people without enough money for food, basic food even. And unfortunately, when we are in the midst of an economic recession, that's when we do have to be paying attention to other parts of the world because they're also very, very vulnerable. And especially when you're talking about places where there is conflict, you know, when people start to experience food shortages, when, you know, the economic crisis deepens, when they don't have access to, to money, that tends to be when you see more tension, uh, more sort of uh, ability of people to, to then start to have disagreements and for people to, to some of the peace deals that have been worked on over, over many, many months to years start to erode because you do start to see interpersonal clashes. So I'm very concerned about that. One of the reasons I like talking to uh, members of voluntary organizations, NGOs we sometimes call them, is that in tough times uh, they're hardened. They don't flag or weary uh, the way some others might, uh, including even in the, the news media. And uh, they have this determination to always r respond to a challenge. I mean, w do you find that general amongst the people you work with, that they, they tend to have a, here's the problem, let's get on with it and fix it? Well, you're on, you're on the front lines and you're accountable to people that you serve. And even for me, having just come back from Darfur, you know, sitting across from, you know, hundreds of women talking to them about, about our work, and they look me in the eye and they say to me things like, uh, you know, which many of them did, you know, please don't give up. Please stay. We need War Child here. You need to keep doing what you're doing. Um, I can't imagine in those situations putting up our hands and saying, you know, I'm sorry, we just can't continue, it's too difficult. What we do is exactly the opposite. We come back and we just try harder. And that's, that's our responsibility. That's why we exist as an organization and that's why we do the work that we do. Well, Dr. Samantha Nutt, it's remarkable work indeed. Thank very you nice very to much. see you again. You too, Brian, thank you. Welcome back. The first part of our program looked at Darfur. The civil war in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is incredibly, even more horrifying. The fighting which started in 1998 and never really ended has been called Africa's World War. It has left more than five million people dead and the killing is of the most macabre kind with women targeted and children recruited as child soldiers. The root cause of all the violence which has plagued Congo for centuries is the struggle for control over vast mineral wealth. 
Wealth is complicated, it's foreign relations, bringing intrusions from neighbors like Rwanda and Uganda. The latter two countries having played important roles in first unseating the longtime dictator Mobutu Sese Seko and then triggering civil war as a land grab ensued. Much of the world has simply tuned out in part because of this complexity of the struggle, but also because of the barbarity of the fighting. CBC producer Moini Katuka from Kenya, however, is among those who believe that we have to try and understand. She recently interviewed three African experts visiting Toronto to talk about Congo. Here's their explanation of how the spiral of violence started and on a possible way out. The Congo is a country which is uh, sick. Sick politically, economically, culturally, sick in everything. Sick of uh, lack of governance, lack of democracy. It's a country of corruption and a country where people does not have the possibility of life and they are struggling for water, they are struggling for housing, they are struggling for school, they don't have any means. It's a country by the name, but there is a uh, non-existence of state in Congo for more than 20 years. It's a complex situation, but in few words I would just uh, say that uh, you see, uh, after the fall of uh, Mobutu's regime, which was a dictatorship, uh, Kabila, the father, came. But he came uh, with Rwandese and Ugandese uh, who had their own agendas. And this agenda uh, is about uh, the implementation to take Kivu province. Uh, uh, and uh, for that they needed to have, uh, as head of state in Congo, people who really don't care about Congolese people. You know, in 96-97, Laurent Desiree Kabila came in the power with a backup of Uganda of Yoweri Museveni and the Rwanda of Paul Kagame. And uh, one year after, 97 to 98, the same two Sea Rwandese who came with Laurent Desiree Kabila start an aggression war supported again by Paul Kagame of Rwanda and Yoweri Museveni of Uganda. And this war has killed more than six million Congolese. Every day there is people dying at the uh, average of 45,000 people by month in Congo. Nobody is speaking about. We have got more than one million brutal sexual crimes. And we have more than two million displaced people around the country. Unfortunately, what we have found is that the conflict is uh, pure and simple, a scramble to control the wealth of the Congo. The coal, uh, the, the gold, the, the diamonds, the uranium, the tin, the lumber, you name it. Congo possesses perhaps uh, 70 to 80 percent of the reserves of coltan. So it is required for modern technology to have access to this mineral and therefore all of us are benefiting from this mineral being uh, used in, the, in, in, in cell phones, uh, it's used in, in, in laptops and computers. And so uh, when we let people know that people are dying so that they can have a better cell phone, that raises uh, people's awareness and it causes people to stop and think, so it, this is not right, this is not just, this is not fair and it must stop. There are many forces who has been their primary agenda to control the use and access of those resources. The American companies, Canadian companies, European companies, you name it, all of them are there for, with the primary purpose of controlling certain uh, deposits of uh, resources in terms of uh, copper and cobalt. And uh, unfortunately what has happened is that the people of the Congo end up in the middle and left out of that equation. Uh, there are so many lobbies, multinational uh, societies, who, who, who take advantage of the confusion in Congo to plunder and always organize more plunder in uh, the Congo. But uh, unless we, have, we reach a good democracy, well, this confusion will continue.
the ICC, the International Criminal Court, has a deterrent role for uh, taking in account the international justice as they did for Rwanda. The thing which is happening today should not happen tomorrow. And the international community knows that there is no peace without justice. In Congo, there is a lack of justice. There is a lot of corruption in all the system of state, from the summit of state up to the, the bottom. And we hope that uh, by uh, establishing a special court on Congo, this will compense the lack of justice which is in the country. A special envoy can be appointed uh, to, to deal with the situations in the Congo, just as there have been special envoys appointed to go to the Middle East and, and also in other uh, countries. Uh, we think that we can make significant progress once we have someone spending uh, some serious time and attention on the issue of the Congo. We think that there can be peace and stability in the Congo once we get foreign forces out of the Congo uh, we are speaking here primarily of Rwanda and Uganda uh, who have been using the resources of the Congo to build their own nations at the expense of the Congolese people. So we need pressure to be placed upon Rwanda, Uganda to, uh, to get out of the Congo, to stop interfering in the affairs of the Congo. Certainly African Union can do something and I think now we're under the impulse of the new president, uh, Mr. Gaddafi. Uh, maybe something good can come out of it, but uh, we should give him a chance uh, to talk to all the, uh, the protagonists of the uh, Congo crisis and maybe also to uh, let uh, the dialogue uh, within uh, African communities take place and uh, we should see uh, at last the international community to accompany uh, the solutions that we decide and not to come and decide uh, in, in our place. Welcome back. In coming weeks, we'll take a look at Cambodia's war crimes tribunals and why observers say they're so flawed. We also have a feature documentary about the pervasiveness of corruption in Russia and a look at a long and winding path of U.S. diplomatic efforts in the Middle East from Carter to Bush. Now, if you miss our broadcast on Saturday or Sunday, you can watch programs online on our website, cbc.ca slash ourworld. Our email address is ourworld at cbc.ca. And that's our show for this week. I'm Brian Stewart. For all of us here, thanks for watching. See you next weekend.